friends. It's true, you know. Personal, local, global wellness. You may now begin the course. The emotional response to love. It's awfully important. Is usually the result of a pretty clumsy family. A show of affection. Redefining what health means for you. And the real fundamental you, you, you. Well, if you'd like a place where there's never a dull moment, choose the right flavor of wellness for you. Syndacy Wellness hosts the personal, local, global wellness show. Today we have with us Patrick O'Donnell and how would you describe yourself in terms of what you've shifted into as a coach these days? How would you describe yourself as a coach? You know, there's a lot of tears that I could answer that question. And I would tell you after the journey I've taken and to where I get, I would say, and look you, if this was a dinner party, I'd say, I'm a divine spark. And would you like to know what I'm currently doing? Because a lot of times people get mixed up with what they're doing with who are you? And I like to really maintain and, con and completely immerse myself in the understanding that who I was and who I came through the door with at birth was this divine, special, precious, wonderful spark of the universe. And through life, somehow that got lost, covered over through conditionings and things. So, you know, keep in mind, I'm a divine spark sitting in front of you. And what, what I've done is to really go through a remembering, a reclaiming, a reconnecting with that. Um, you know, the story of getting there is quite an extensive one, of you, as you and I have talked about. So, you know, I've, I've done corporate life, I've done music, I've done climbing. These are doings, these are things I've done. And in those doings, I've had a really, really wonderful, you know, life that I'm grateful for, but it didn't start that way. <laughs> yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, and I feel I'm much more excited in having people describe themselves because of the excitement they they I think people get excited when others describe them but I couldn't have said it better myself from having the great fortune of knowing Patrick and counseling each other as friends and definitely feeling so comfortable in my struggles to come to him anytime I feel that at least in my experience of knowing you and others who connect with you that you do help people as you well you spoke for yourself but initiate and remember their divine spark. I want to ask you a bit about, because I know you a little bit, and I'm curious on what, as a general topic and whatever comes to mind, how have your experiences been with the word religion? What, you know, that's always a, a great topic and, and trying not to throw stones honor something that's deep and timeless, yet also talk about my experience with it. Um, and realize there's the Socratic line of thinking, thinking, there's psychology, and there's all that kind of thing that goes into my experience I've described. And then there's the wondrous, there's the spiritual part, there's the depth of it. So there's two things. When I tell you my experience with religion, I was born Irish Catholic in Chicago. You know, my ship sailed into the bay the year of our Lord, 1956, on Halloween, and there was two of us. I had an identical twin brother born with me. And, uh, you know, we were raised in that way of, of Catholicism, of going to catechism, of, you know, just totally immersed in Catholic school. I was an altar boy. Initially, I was super mystified because the mass was in Latin back then, and they'd swing incense, and the, it was candlelit, and it was really mystical. And then I met, uh, then I met a lovely pastor of our um, of our community, and through various 
things of me just being a little boy acting out, playing in church. Seven-year-olds don't sit still anyway. Well, through that, I was taken to the rectory, if you will, and I was um, told I was a, a dirty, rotten little boy that no God could love. And then this man set to cleanse me by sexually abusing me. And I'm going to make the story short, and I'll also preference this with I did over 20 years of work on this. So talking about it, this is not something that's me. It's something that happened. Just so people go, don't go to some bad place about it. It's just something that happened. Um, and when it became apparent he was doing something, I went to the door and I knocked. And they had obviously contacted him. And he said, go away. Our lessons are done. Close the door. I said something that tainted my entire life. I said, but you never forgave me. That set me on a path of being never good enough, of always being dirty, and that I needed to be forgiven for something because just who I was was not enough, and I needed to be forgiven. And that stayed with me, oh my God, through 30 years of my life. You know, and it showed up in different ways. It showed up in, you know, I could not have relationships with people. Intimacy was too terrifying for me. Uh, intravenous drugs, alcohol, really, really dark side of life that I kept trying to relive over and over, expecting a different outcome. <laughs> and it never was a different outcome. <laughs> so um, religion... I think there is absolute mysticism, and you and I have talked about the Jewish faith. I was always mystified. My friends were all Jewish, and I was like, wow. I was always super mystified by that, because I knew my own religion. I didn't want to go back and touch that one. There was too much wounding there. So nowadays, I know Catholic priests. I have friends that are priests. It's not an indictment on the Catholic religion. It was an indictment on a man. So religion is religion, and there's people in it. There could be wondrous special ones. There could be ones dragging around a pretty dark past. Yeah, that helps. The in-depth work that you've done on yourself and being able to pinpoint the, the thoughts that are coming to me is a lot of people, when they have a traumatic experience, especially when we're young and we don't have the tools, intellect, or perspective to digest what's just happened, sometimes shoved away and sometimes is just completely almost forgotten uh one of my friends she was i was just talking to her kidnapped as a child but she's had been having dreams for 20 years of being kidnapped and she didn't remember it but her she asked her mom when she was you know maybe probably 20 is like was i kidnapped and she was like yes and we think it was had to do with sexual trafficking and this was in a different country but how on earth if people and i'm going to get gender specific and start to say young men have traumatic experiences do they even start to go into that first of all it's like a tunnel then it's a fog then there's all these emotions and then be able to come out so eloquently as you said you've worked on it for 20 years with the words i didn't quite just jot down but struggles with intimacy and, and connecting physically with people and, and then you started to watch how that was unraveling in your life. How would you tell someone if they feel there's a ghost lurking in their closet, how to even start to get, you know, close to just even look at it or start to, you know, make a little bit of contact to, to then dissect and open up and befriend the, the hauntings inside you. How, how do people, how would you give them any kind of, guidance to start that journey if it feels so hidden and so pushed far away even though it's still inside them probably manifesting in all different aspects of their lives well there's a couple of tools that were taught to me by wonderful teachers and one thing i was always told i couldn't do it alone and to try to go down that path alone without some trusted confidant or therapist or coach 
it really it just extends it. You might get there. Hey, there's miracles. There's people that just, but to me, to begin to start writing, to journal before you go to bed or journal. I journal in the morning when the sun's coming up because I'm just clearer then. That's my choice. But the journaling and the writing about what you're experiencing and feeling and try to get a meditation practice, some kind of practice where you can drop into yourself and use diaphragmatic breathing, which is breathe into your belly and then breathe out through your mouth and make it just like a circle, like a balloon and out. And you and I are familiar with all the breathing techniques. Um, but diaphragmatic breathing is something that will help you to be mindful in the moment because you know, most of our minds like the and getting them quiet is a real treat. Um, and it took me years to develop that. There's also the use of what's out there. If you look it up online, there's binaural beats and use of binaural beats lightly and music behind you. What they've done is gone and found what Tibetan monks' minds actually scan at and they have grabbed that eight, you know, that megahertz. And they'll put it behind music, and you go, you go deep. And something might come up there, and it might be absolutely terrifying. That's why you don't want to do it alone. You want to be able to be able to have a confidant. You can bounce all those experiences off of. Those are a few things. Yes, yes, because there's so many arguments and so many people I connect with who say, like, meditate. And I was, one, I was definitely one of them, I'd say, 10 years ago meditation don't get that near me i need to move at all times like i was physical at dancer acting boarding and the idea of sitting and my mind going still in these cartoons or movies that i'd seen i was like no way i'll never get next to that until and there's a little picture of gandhi on my wall just sitting there, you know smiling because at first when i was trying to close my eyes I was having to confront all these things hidden in the closet that i didn't want to i didn't want to see i didn't want to feel and I love how you spoke just diaphragmatic breathing or one thing to focus on and knowing that it's just practicing kind of focus at first to be able to be in the body and then start to address everything that's being built up in the body and, and how precious that is to have someone to just try it with. Because they talk about the absence of addiction is connection often. These things that we, we are so uncomfortable to experience and feel um, then we, we try and numb. But if we have, even I can see like two guys, you know, after a sporting game, just try and sit down and bring themselves down together and, and then communicate together afterwards. Like, well, that didn't really work for me. I was just thinking about, you know, what I want for dinner. And the other one's like, well, I was thinking about this girl who hasn't texted me back. But that, that connection of when we do try something new, especially the misconceptions about meditation, doing it together. I think that is key. And now from just chatting with you, I'm like, wow, anytime I suggest people try and meditate, and that's why people like the app so much, Insight Timer, 10% Happier, because they are with someone and we are such social animals. Um, if anything's coming to you, please. No, I, I agree with everything you're saying. We all... You know, my brother, my twin brother, he may not have had the same experience, but our family life was one where we weren't touched. We were not told we were loved. Hell, they didn't even teach us to brush our teeth. We had to figure all that out. And my, my twin brother who is on, he's on his own path and he wouldn't tell you it's spiritual. I think they're all spiritual, but he said, we're like wolf clubs. We're licked off out of the womb and whipped out in the snow. I went, whoa. Very descriptive, and you know, that's his thing. But he, to develop ways that you can live life without dying from lack of touch as a baby, um, he became really focused on what he wanted, and that turned out to be climbing. I mean, the guy was doing things when he was 17 years old that people had been aspiring to do all their lives. He was just driven, just driven. Me, I chose that banjo back there, and I talked through that banjo because I couldn't talk to you. I was too scared. You might not like me or love me. And those are the kind of things everybody, you, cartoons and dancing and being really active, that's how you dealt 
with it. Everybody has their own specific thing they do. Definitely. Um, I, yeah, so, so many thoughts, so many thoughts on that, <laughs> on, on, on move, moving energy and, and that in the beginning they, they say there's like a, a, a word from the greatest book known to man, the Bible, that be still and know I am God. And the idea of being still in the beginning of intense self-reflective or spiritual work is not something that that comes in the beginning stages at least in my point of view there is sometimes a lot of blockage and a lot of pent up i'm learning about these new words in trauma therapy like impactology and contact care and in new zealand they've developed these incredible uh therapies i just had a recent fall down a mountain and so there's been some contact to my spine and these farmers there, they've been falling off tractors or doing very physical things. And then their, their bodies stop working. But some of them went and started studying how to release a lot of the buildup and trauma that gets stuck when we don't address. We can just start from a physical point of view, physical injuries. And then there's the whole spiritual perspectives of pent up emotions and chakras and, and organs. Um, and how necessary as we you know as children i think it's more natural that we just know to and, and it's more i think normalized to scream and cry and then as we get older all of a sudden we have to start like kind of channeling it in a different direction um but all in, in my feeling to be to feel connected and to feel loved and approved of and so this thing that becomes fun like a sport or an extracurricular becomes, I have to be at the top of the top. And Correct. a beautiful quote of like, even nature doesn't bloom 24 seven, but when you try and be at the top of the top of the top, sometimes that balance, which is the body's nature is thrown out the window and we're taking medicine in the locker room, such as steroids or, you know, enhancing drugs and things start to get out of control and, and the body starts to exhibit that later on. I mean, even the NFL brain bank can show when people start to things <laughs> off the field and don't address them, what has happened later on and, and how their brain has been affected and what is happening domestically in the home life. Um, yeah, the, the kind of the, the topic of releasing energy in a way not to, to feel and focus on some things that are bothering us I wonder if you can talk us through a couple stories of where you started to see toxic habits of um, patterns that you were probably had a lot of uh, emotional pent up pain and you decided to go down one lifestyle, one path, and then, and then maybe it shifted to a different path that you feel is healthier. Oh boy. <clears throat> That's, um, yeah, it's another one of those massively large topics. Um, I, you know, backing up what you said is true. I have a, a little ditty that has been told to me years ago, tissues hold issues. So in other words, your body, your tissues, your, your stuff maintains that trauma. And, you know, going back to who I am and why I do this, it is to hopefully walk with people to do some kind of inter, you know, integral thing, which is the necess the necess necessity to be complete, you know, to come together. And when I look at it that way, I was gifted and I believe guided at some, some way because there is just no way this lifetime I should have lived through some of the things that were happening. I mean, my God, I was an underground miner at 18 years old and I got caught in a bear in a cave in and was trapped for, you know, a long, long time banging on the pipes like you see in movies, hoping somebody was going to come and get me. Those kind of traumas said, well, this isn't for me. I think I'll go this direction. And I became really good at like, at like finding a door out of certain situations that wouldn't work for me. And I always chose very intense things. Um, 
music was a wonderful thing that worked for a long time, but then it, then it didn't work. You know, it just didn't work because I found, started to find my voice in therapy. I started to, to be able to speak and I didn't need to be on these huge stages in front of people anymore saying, see me, you know, look what I can do. And I started then moving over into climbing where it started getting a little better. I wanted to be of service. After about five years of climbing, I became a guide. So then I started guiding, you name it, couples that just got married to the top of the Grand Teton, you know, physically handicapped people up mountains where they'd have spiritual experiences, and I did too. It became a little more focused, but that is because I had been working, as I said before, with a trusted confidant. She was a coach. My dear Rosa Mazzoni was a coach, five foot tall Italian lady that would get in my face when she needed to. And she started having a profound effect on my thinking. And when she showed me this card, which says, this is my green card for life is what she told me. I am a precious, wondrous, special, unique, divine, rare, valuable, whole, sacred, total, complete, entitled, worthy, and deserving person. And when I started to believe that, things started to change. And that is the thing. When you realize your divine prestige, a lot of people would say how arrogant and things like that. But when you start to realize who you are is just wonderful. No matter what you think or say, you know, I know what I am. And when I started to get a hold of that, then things that I started moving towards started going into place. And when climbing ended, due to an accident, I found a door. And I moved into um, working in a yoga organization, trying to get my mobility back after the accident. And through that, I met... A lot of people. And I met another person. Rosa passed on, and I met another person who was my master in teaching me about my emotions. So the journey never really ends, it just continued. Wow. Oh my gosh, it's so exciting to hear it. It's long. <laughs> yeah, it just goes, it goes like that. And you know, this idea of, wow, maybe I can celebrate who I am. Oh my God, just because I'm living. I mean, here's, here's one for you. Rabbi Herschel, have you ever heard of him? Mm, yes. He said, just to be is a blessing. Mm. Just to live is holy. Mm -hmm. That's, when you start getting a hold of that, just a little bit, it gets fleeting. And oh, 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 I want more of that. And then you just begin to really start to look at yourself in the mirror and love yourself. Because if you love yourself, you're gonna look out in the world and say, I can't help but love you. Because they are you. Yeah. And nature, we always go, oh, what a wonderful sunrise. Oh my God, look at the trees and the flowers. Well, those are you. That's it, that's the connection. So underneath this whole Socratic thing that we've talked a little bit about, about therapies and things like that, there is this whole, mystery of consciousness and the connection that plays in with that but you know for each person it's their own it's what they need to, to reclaim and connect and remember you know you don't have to do the, the spiritual thing one thing is is i do believe this kind of reclaiming the work that i've done the work you're doing no spiritual bypass can happen there you can't go I'm going to go do some yoga move for 15 hours until I throw up and that's going to go away. No, you got to look it right in the eye. You got to look it in the eye like a gunfighter at noon, you know, <laughs> I'm taking you on, not I'm going to go around it with some spiritual practice. That's not going to do that. Yes. Yes. That's my own belief. Everybody has their own, but that is my. Belief. So many people get distracted in, um, Yes, in, in doing rather than kind of sitting and, con and 
confronting and feeling the things that they don't want to feel. Like for me, I, I really believe if I don't look at myself in the, the darkness and the, the things that are haunting me and bothering me and say, oh, wait, those, those are things that I'm really struggling with right now, then I can't ask for assistance and help in what I need. Because usually I would always be distracting myself with, with something different instead of, instead of just working through the gross, uh, shitty things <laughs> that I needed to, to really look at. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the most courageous thing you'll do in your life. It truly is the most courageous thing you'll do ever yeah. is to turn that gear around and look at that. Yeah, I, I think what's funny is we think that it's going to be so uncomfortable to be honest with ourselves and meet ourselves that we don't realize all the things we're doing to distract ourselves from sitting in our pain and just acknowledging that 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 soreness and that that bitterness needs needs acknowledgement. You know, we might not love it, but we need to look at it and we need to honor it. But we don't real like what I didn't realize was all these things like I would pull my hair or I would stay up too late on social media distracting myself. I didn't realize that was not helping me either. That was also discomfort. But but I just didn't want to be. And so that and this what we're talking about is it is a crazy hard topic for people to wrap themselves around when for so long we are in a culture that is even kind of numbing, you know, with the party scenes that we see on television and the amount of sugar and alcohol and uh, the excessive ways that we are kind of dulling our senses. Um, it's like that idea of, I would hear boys say, when you're hungover, you just drink another beer in the morning. I don't really know. You're the dog. Pardon? <laughs> Pardon? Hair of the dog is what they call yeah. it. <laughs> Hair of the dog. Like chemistry wise, if it really is helping, <laughs> I don't know if it actually helps anything <laughs> to like get your body to release those toxins to get started again. So anyway, um, I think we've covered so many amazing things. I, um, I'm wondering to go back to the incredible story that you were taking us through, if there's any trademark moments or events that led up to um, draw you away from a lifestyle that you were in, as you just spoke on when you got stuck in, in the, um, the tunnel, if you have any other moments that you experienced that really woke you up to seeing oh, I thought I could glide and be in this environment or lifestyle, but I really need to shift. You know, I think we all live for that moment. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is we don't realize we had a million moments that we need to be grateful for. We keep looking for the next moment where, you know, a baseball player slaps a, a grand slam in the seventh game of the World Series, you know that moment is what people are kind of looking for. And, uh, and I've run across, I have a lot of friends and a lot of acquaintances and people I've worked with. But for me, <laughs> there's moments where something showed up and pulled me out. So I believe that was divine intervention. Some people call it angels, other call it guides. Some people don't know what to call it, but I mean, there's, I mean, I've gone off of cliffs and if you know what a Fiat is, it's a tiny little car. I went off of a cliff and went end over end to the bottom of a 400 foot ravine and looked at my partner and said, you okay? Yeah, I think so. How did we even live through that? <laughs> you know? And then that cave in in the mine happened. And really I thought it was over because we were, we were running out of air to breathe. And, you know, and then all of a sudden, in the last minute, somebody was poking a, poking a rod through and punching a hole. You guys okay? You know, I mean, there's all these moments where even relationships that weren't good for me. I got a job 
across the country and was pulled out. I mean, I mean, things like that would just simultaneously happen. And now that I look back, I know what those were. And so there's, there's that whole thing about that. I can remember hanging, if, I don't know if you've ever been in Yosemite, there's a climb called El Capitan. And it's 3,000 vertical feet of rock. And we had run out of water the last day, and it was 100 degrees, so we were hammered. And Jumar, if you're not leading you, Jumar up a rope. I didn't have any strength. Sun was going down, and I hung on the ropes and just, I can't do this. And something appeared next to me and said, you're not done yet. Get up the ropes. Yeah. And then my, then my brother, the famous climber, came over the edge and threw another rope and said, get on the rope. We're not getting rescued now. Cigarette hanging out of his mouth, totally unaffected. Me, hammered. <laughs> so it, that was a huge awakening that something else exists and something else wants me to pay attention. So there's a lot of those moments where something was dinging a bell and I better pay attention. You know, and that's that's through a lot of things. Corporate life, you know, that was there were situations there where in the end, with me, before I decided to go into this work, it just was something I couldn't do anymore. I just heard a bell, doorbell one night in the middle of the night. And no, my wife said, nobody, nobody rang a doorbell, but I heard a doorbell go. Wake up. Come to the door. <laughs> so there's a lot of these things. If you pay attention, they're probably happening around you. And... Uh, you just need to be more mindful. Again, meditation and breathing and things like that bring you down. Yes, and mindfulness is so practical. And, and it's like almost baby baby world or baby talk. Because like um, the beautiful Winnie the Pooh movie um, that just came out, it's called Christopher Robin with, I can't yes. remember his name, but Erin McGregor, who I love. He is sitting across from Pooh. And he just said, like, Pooh, can you just just do your own thing? I need to do some work. And Pooh is like looking out the window, playing, because we often forget to play as we get older. And he's like, car, tree, mailbox. And he's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm playing the IC game. And people create an off Oftentimes we like the way our analytical brains run to have this huge explanation with scientific data and research proven, but to express what mindfulness is, but just noting and being mindful of what is existing around you redirects your mind from just being on caution, alert, futurizing and worrying and, you know, sabotaging the moment. And I love that poo game. Because when I get really overwhelmed, especially when I'm driving and I, I quite need to be alert, <laughs> other people will be affected if I am not in check. I have to play the poo game and just like name to myself what's around me to get myself in that moment. And I had a similar beautiful saying from my mentor that signs are all around me when I get stuck and I feel like with my depression or with my anxiety that I literally can't move. And it happens often. I literally have to just look up and then all of a sudden I'll see a butterfly, which will make me think of a friend who makes me think of singing a song. And then that lifts my spirit, but we are not trained. It's wonderful. because There are millions of people now doing work in schools and in education to help us become more mindful in the education model. But I wasn't at least to be mindful and then to see all the opportunities to shift my energy and shift, um, because everything is always changing. It's the only constant, the kind of state that I'm in. Um, it's incredibly, incredibly useful <laughs> to practice. I just started to have a thought on your experience in the corporate world. You were working at Lockheed Martin and my mind is bringing me back to when you brought mindfulness into the workplace. Would you mind walking us through a bit of what prompted you, what events led up to you teaching there and how it was received, whatever comes to mind? 
in painting the scene of where you were and who was who you were teaching because it gets me. Yeah, it was, um, again, it's that thing of wanting to share something with people that's going to help them. And how that meant when I got involved with working in the yoga movement, which, by the way, the body, the body, the body is a key element of remembering. So I don't want anybody to think that you can't do movement and you don't get anything from it. You do. So when this wrist had been knocked off my body and put back on, I had to gain mobility and they said, do yoga. So I found a yoga movement that was a little more than just that. And when I started to do it and my life started to change, I started to relax and open up. I was working and I was the uh, senior manager of transportation in Sunnyvale, California at Lockheed. What that meant was 80 people, four managers, we were dropping satellites on C5As and huge airplanes heading to launch sites. Big stress. I had over-the-road guys all over the country calling me at four in the morning. I'm stuck at the scales in Louisiana, boss. You know, those kind of things was just five years of that. So then I started noticing with the safety guy that I had a lot of injuries in my staff and I had a lot of missed time. And what I was watching, I started watching these guys getting up on the beds of the trucks and they and they had no core strength left. And they were, you know, they're they were aging, middle aged, I don't like to say old, you know, they were fifty in their fifties and they just had a hard time and they were falling down the ladders and doing stuff. And I got the idea why don't I try to do yoga in the morning before the shift with these guys and get them, A, number one, to pay more attention to what they're doing, and B, impact their bodies and start to loosen them up. And I went to a room full of truck drivers and said, I want to do yoga with you guys in the morning. And they went, get out of here. We're not going there. I said, no, we're not. We're, I'm the boss. But I said, why don't you give me three months? Give me three months in the morning, and every Monday we'll do meditation Mondays in the conference room, and we'll learn to breathe and relax. Okay, right? I'll tell you what, about a month in, nobody was missing those classes. And there was a very good YouTube video done about it, interviewing these guys. Then I went to, after I got those results, and I started watching a decline in injuries and loss time. I went to the company doctor, the corporate doctor, and said, here's what I want to do. I had a PowerPoint presentation and did the typical corporate thing. And uh, I said, I just want to do this. And he goes, I don't have any problem. I don't have any funds, though. And I said, okay, well, I'll see if I can find the funding. And he said, go forth and prosper. And then I had the, the uh, a session with my mentor and she was the director of finance and budgets at Lockheed. And uh, she said, so what are you doing? And I said, well, this is kind of off, you know, off script here. Here's what I'm doing in my job, but this is something I'm wanting to do. And she went, how much is that going to cost? I said, well, I need, I, I gave her the dollar figure. This is what I need. And she goes, go see Jim after this meeting, Jim McCann and he'll get you set up for your budget. Just boom. So when things are supposed to happen and you do them with good intention and you're on the trail and you're loving what you're doing and it's not work, things happen. And that was a big lesson out of that. And it was put in the wellness centers and we had engineers and things that said it changed my life. It changed my life. We get to start again every lunch and relax. I mean, statements that just blew me away. You know, it was emotional for me watching these very heady creatures, you know, engineer, deny, design engineers at that, coming in and having these big experiences. Mm -hmm. And then I moved, I moved back to Denver and I started it in Denver and it's still going to my, on the docks. I did a train the trainer Instead of trying to hire somebody, I trained the trainers, yeah. and they, they're still doing it. I'm gone, it lives on. Exactly. I'll never forget. I don't know, maybe it was 
could be two, three years ago, and I don't know when the promo or commercial it looked was shot, but something happened and I was home. So I was in the car with my mom and we're pulling into the garage and I'm on YouTube and I'm just crying and we're getting home and she's just like in her zone and she looks over and she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I'm watching these guys in yellow vests and they're in a warehouse and they're, they're doing yoga before they're about to move the equipment. <laughs> I was like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't understand. I don't know who this guy is, but I have to meet him. This is before I knew Patrick. And I'm like, but I've never seen like construction workers, you know, been standing up, shaking their bodies and stretching out. And I was just like, and my mom was caught off guard, but I was like, do you have any idea? And then, you know, Patrick started to show me the, uh, the research and the data of like the loss of um, work time and the, the decrease of people being injured. These are huge machines. And, and it was so exciting. And so many people, um, that's what this podcast is about, are, are doing incredible work to help people gain their health and, um, and uh, shift their lifestyle to be you know, towards health and wellness. And um, so that, that just, that gets me every time I, I remember that story. Um, and so I'm going to go back to some questions that I have for you. And if anything comes to mind, feel free to share. Um, my, my feeling is, is talking about uh, anyone you might feel comfortable with who has come to you as a client um, and started to have some profound changes in lifestyle and perspective. If any stories come to mind, if not, it's totally fine. Or if you don't feel comfortable going there of uh, young or old people and, and their awareness of what, what kind of track they were in and that, that, that it could shift. Um, I recently had an experience of just sharing uh, about my weight gain and weight loss and being a woman in this American culture society and just doing a live on social media about it taking me three years of a lot of weight gain and loss and then looking down and being able to say like I love my belly and just putting a post and getting hundreds of of uh, messages and and a wonderful girl who suffers from body dysmorphic disorder which I'd done a big research paper about in my academic years reached out to me who hadn't left her house for six months. And that connection of, of just being myself and wanting to share my journey has brought the most incredible experiences and, and, and lessons into my life from others uh, feeling that they could connect. Yeah, that idea of instilling an intrinsic sense of value you know, it is this internal good that you need, that you feel this, you know, that's what I'd like to see. And I, I remember there was one woman, she was a young girl just recently. I say girl, and I can say that um, <laughs> compared to my age. I hired her in Sunnyvale and she was just fresh out of Michigan State University with all the grades and smart as a whip. And she was Asian, she was Korean. So she had, she had a cultural thing that she brought with her into the job. And if you know anything about Asians, I do because I'm married to one for 14 years. They are driven people when it comes to, if they sign up to something and do a job, they just don't do a halfway crappy job. Go gotta go mountain bike and do it after work. They, they put everything they got into the and she came on board and I told her what I wanted to do. And she read three books in the first weekend. And I was like, oh, this is, this is a keeper. <laughs> and, uh, but then something happened. Some of the older, what you want to call seasoned, but I call just we're in the rut employees got real pissed off at her because she kept uncovering things. They were doing less than adequate jobs. At, and they attacked her. And, uh, it was brutal. The guy that got shown shown off the site and was suspended. She was terrified out of her mind. And at that point, then I started working with her. I said, okay, I'm your boss. 
but we want to start looking at and being a little more focused on who you are. Not the job, not your parents, not this, not that, but who you are. Because who you are is beautiful. And if you get that, and she was bawling out, giving her tissues in my office with the door closed, I said, none of this matters. It doesn't matter if you make me happy. It doesn't matter if you make the company happy. You'll be intrinsically happy. So she started doing some work with me, and, um, you know, they let that guy back, back on the job. He did her next to her, and she came in with her little ID badge and threw it down and said, I'm out of here. I cannot sit next to that. I said, sit down. Now, here's another great story. I said, where do your parents live? They said, Morristown, New Jersey. There's a facility in Morristown. Do you want to work there? She goes, well, how are you going to work that? Stop crying and listen. And I called my buddy, Rich, buddy, Patrick, how's it going? Great counsel this year. Yeah, it was awesome. I said, hey, listen, you said you're going to hire two employees. I'm just putting the Rex in the street. And I said, really? I'm going to do a resume. I'm going to have her apply. And I don't want to lose this girl, but she needs to be close to her family. That's you, Morristown. She was gone in two weeks with a reload package. They moved all of her stuff. And my boss said, how did she get that job so fast? I don't know. And she started to get that she was good and okay, just as she was. And her parents send me coffee every year at Christmas and thank me for taking care of their daughter. <laughs> um, but those kind of those kind of life changing moments like that, and she moved and she moved what you call it, level two level two coming in the company in the company level being a level four four see a see in two years. That's that's remarkable. And I keep telling her to celebrate and you and I both have experience with the Koreans and they can be a rather you know, they can be a rather intense. And she's now just starting to smile because I say, you can't get off the call without smiling. Okay. You know? <laughs> and that's, that's a person in their 20s that's wanting to change, sticks with it, does the work. She wants to change as much as I wanted for her. That's the decipherer. You can want to help people, but unless they want to help themselves, you're spinning your wheels in the mud. And she wanted it. And it's one of my greatest stories. I told it to a room full of, there was an admiral, a general, two generals, a colonel, and my boss at the space symposium when I was still in corporate. And they said, what's your story of inspiration? And I told that, and this, this woman was the admiral, and she said, that's absolutely profound. You keep doing that life. And these are people with big power, you know. And they saw that that is a, that the element that's not available Lost a lot of things. Here's my story. Stick into it. If anything is bubbling up for for sharing with, I feel most inclined to say for young men um, because of just data on when I go to introspective um, life skill training when it comes to mindfulness or yoga you know is it described as connecting mind and body and being aware of how we're interacting with others and self conscious in a positive sense I don't see many men there <laughs> and for a lot of young men watching this, um, or even in the industry you were in, in the culture of that industry, uh, in what's needed. Well, I can I can move you know I can move through. You know I know a lot of climbers, young and I mean strong guys. They're out there tearing up. Huh, I'm like yeah. <laughs> you know, they're they're you know much as I used to have an aversion to it, they're tatted out and they're, they're out there tearing it up in the mountains. And they're strong. And I, I always go out with them and say, I'm the old man on a rope. 
I know the route, but you're going to climb it, you know. And then I can look at the corporate side too. And what what I know in what is known as the millennial vein, I hate labels. I really don't like them. But when, what's going on with the world now is it is a needed change. And there's a strength and there might be an, an unconscious consciousness of charging forward that even I can know, I know I did. I know I did at that age. And what I can say is though, when I teach a class known as what I do is not who I am, it really, really, I, people listen. They can't help but listen because it talks about the encoding, the script, you know, the, the you know, encoding and programming that goes on as a, as a young boy to be this man, you've got to do these things. Sports is one or be super smart or daddy's going to be not happy with you. You start waking people up to that fact. They start awakening and remembering themselves. And I offer the help. And I got a lot of guys I still mentor that are in corporate. And they're in their 26 to 35 age range. And they love to talk. And they love to hear about this stuff. They may not tell their girlfriends over dinner, but they, you know, they still are open and available. And to say they're not is not fair. No. So. I mean, that, that's the truth of it. The fact that men and women, um, I'll, I'll say, uh, self-expressed in other ways, you know, like non mm -hmm. is not something that I can speak to at this moment. But pay honor to uh, if, if it's watching that in the history or or works that I've read that men and women do process differently um, we do yeah. that is okay and like you said not talking to your girlfriend over dinner about your awakenings or introspective work that you're doing is okay but she will feel it and see it and <laughs> respond and react at certain at certain times in certain moments when you do that work. So, so in whatever way, form or shape or flavoring that work has to be done, if you identify as gender masculine, uh, the more power to you and finding someone um, to guide you and coach you through those times and troubles is, is something I'm in support of, especially with the political turmoil that we're in and a lot of my my male friends who are coaches in the mindfulness and self-development world, they are standing up as men who are emotionally available and, and really, and really owning the fact that women and men, we raise boys and girls and the way that men in politics are acting and the way that women in politics are acting, you know, it starts in how we're educated in what way is it okay to act? And I'm watching some very powerful men stand up in the media and say that we can respond differently. Um, and we don't need to use our emotions as an abusive power. And so I just say so much thanks to you in paving the way and being a person that people can come to um, for help in this, this domain. Um, Thank you. and you're welcome and i just you know it's a big honor to be here and the one thing i sent uh i sent Mo michelle obama on her twitter thing jackie robinson was the first black ball player correct branch ricky was the owner of the brooklyn dodgers and when he was pitching to him to get to come in and do this and you got to know back then a black ball player in the major league, oh my God, the world was about to be shook up. So Brant, you know, he had this great vision of doing this. And Jackie Robinson said, so you want a player who doesn't have the guts to fight back? He said, no, I want a player that has the guts not to fight back. People aren't going to like this, you know. Negroes don't belong. Your en enemy will be out in force, and you cannot meet him on his low ground. We win with hitting. Fielding, running, only that. 
We win if the world is convinced of two things, that you are a fine gentleman, a great baseball player. You got to have the guts to turn the other cheek. I mean, that says it all right there. I hope she likes it. I hope she uses it. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I've had a lot of people uh, kind of make fun of me when I wouldn't want to get involved with political discussions. And that was because I felt that people sensed they could abuse their emotional power when it came to speaking on the um, the topic of politics. And I was more interested in finding and understanding people's perspectives than. Right. That's it. Someone into the ground with my opinion that that wasn't interesting to me, and it seems that um, there are certain topics where it's okay to be emotionally almost—I don't have a better word—but abusive. In, in it's thuggery. Way. It's thuggery, is what it is. Yeah, that is not okay in any topic. We can no. keep ourselves contained, and we can be cordial and respectful, even if we have different opinions or our different genders. It doesn't matter what gender we are and how we are allowed to. Thank you. Yelling, you know, and what I love, one of my mentors says, anger is a very valid emotion that needs to be expressed and released, but try and do it where you won't harm other nervous systems. Even That's if you correct. Yell in, a field. yell in the field, you know me? Like, I throw eggs sometimes. I just, I don't know how to get it out. I need to just break something, but I don't go scream in someone's face. And if we don't take the time to look at these things that are building up inside, it will be like one of my best friends. He couldn't get her ice machine to work and she'd had a month, you know? And then someone comes in and asks her a question. She just breaks, it breaks down. Um, so the so such incredible, incredible, topics and, and issues that we're, we're covering and I think is it time do you have to go do you have another appointment well in the busy schedule of things yes I got another appointment and you and I talk for three hours whenever we do this but I if people are watching this I just want to make sure they know that I learned to make have this little boy here right there celebrate 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 in the end who he is and that's what i want for everybody to just celebrate their humanness their beingness and be grateful for their doing this and i thank you i thank all you know the teachers and things that both of us have been involved with i want to show a level of gratitude for everybody doing this work in the universe that is just profound stuff Thank you all for watching, and I hope you guys have a great night. Bye-bye. Well, if you'd like a place where there's never a dull moment, choose the right flavor of wellness for you. Syndacy Wellness hosts the personal, local, global wellness show.